Greetings and welcome to the Radio Life Baptist Church of Los Angeles. I am Dr. Patrick Ross. I serve as the senior pastor here, and we are delighted that you have tuned in uh, to worship with us on today. We ask you would subscribe, like, and share on all of our virtual platforms with your family, with your friends, your loved ones, all those that you believe would be blessed as a result of our worship encounter here at the Great New Life Church. We thank God for you, we pray for you, and the best is yet to come for you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, hallelujah. Praise God. How many know the Lord is blessing? The Lord is constantly blessing. anybody in this place on this morning? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Psalms 1 and 3, I ask that you guys would please stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord all my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfy thy mouth with good things, so that so that the youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord exalteth righteousness and judgment for all that are for are all oppressed. He made known his way unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Amen. Come on, y'all. Let's put our, put our hands together and bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Just for being God, just for being amazing, just for being awesome, just for being everything we need him to be. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. If you would like to come to the altar, the altar is now open. Amen. If you would like to come to the altar, please, please, ma'am, please, sir. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we honor you on this morning. God, we bless you. God, we give your name all the glory, the honor, and the praise. God, we thank you for being amazing. We thank you for being kind. We thank you for being loving. God, thank you for being our protector, our sustainer. God, thank you, Lord, for being everything we need you to be and more. God, thank you for being God and being God all by yourself. God, we love you, Lord. We, we honor you, God, and we bless you, God, simply because of who you are. God, not because of what you've done, but, but God, because of who you are. For God, you are Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning beginning and the end. You are the creator of all. You are everything. We need you to be and more. So God, we love you on today. And Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together one more time, Lord, just to bless your holy name. For God, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and to your courts with praise. And Lord, we thank for unto you and we will bless your name. Why, God? Because you are a good God. <laughs> you are an amazing God. You are a strong God. You are an awesome God. You are the everlasting God. God, you are a God full of grace. You are a God full of mercy. You are a God full of love and full of kindness. You are that type of God. And so, God, we gather on this morning not to see what we have on, but God, just to open up our mouths and give you our best worship, to lift up our hands, God, to we lay, we, we, we give you all of our best praise. We give you all of our best worship. God, you deserve it. Now, God, some of us, Lord, this has been a trying week, but Lord, we still say you deserve our worship. This has been a hard week, but God, you still deserve our worship. So God, we lay everything at the altar. We lay our burdens at the altar. For God, you said in your word that you are a God that will accept all everything. So Lord, we lay our burdens to you, God. We lay our problems to you. We, we lay our, our insecurities to you, God. Anything that we're battling with, God, we put it in your hands. We put it in your hands. And God, we know that when we put it in your hands, Everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Everything is going to be all right. When we put our problems in your hands, when we put our issues in your hands, God, we know that you are a God that's going to turn things around. You are a God that's going to make our, 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 our make our way straight. You are that type of God that we know that everything is going to be all right. And God, we'll be so careful to give your name all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Let everybody shout amen. Amen, amen, amen and amen. Come on, y'all. Let's put those blessed hands together. And let's honor our God for all the great things that he has done. Don't stop. Praise him. Keep praising him. Keep praising him. Our God is a good God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is amazing. Oh, you're amazing. And you're Alpha and Omega, Lord. Hallelujah.
And he reigns forever and ever Say he is a mighty God And he reigns forever You say Our God is a mighty God so service of the Greater New Light Missionary Baptist Church. Together with our pastor, Dr. Patrick D. Ross, and the entire membership of this church, we are happy that you chose to join in fellowship with us on today as we gather to celebrate Jesus for who he is, King of kings and Lord of lords, King of kings and Lord of Lords, we welcome you. And please feel free to come again, whether it be in person or virtually. You are welcome at the Greater New Light Church. Our announcements for the week of April 14th, 2024. Virtual Bible study is on Wednesday, April 17th 
at 7 o'clock p.m. Virtual church school is Friday, April 19th at 6.30 p.m. Information for both of these virtual events can be found on our social media platforms. Corporate prayer is on Saturday, April the 20th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. Seeking God's face together brings great joy and comfort. For God does hear and he does answer prayer. If you agree with me, God does hear and he does answer prayer. And for that, we give him thanks and praise. I encourage you to stay tuned for additional information coming up on our church calendar about other opportunities for you to participate in the ministry and the activities of this church. One of which will be church school resume, I'm sorry, children's church school resuming on Sunday, June the 9th and June the 23rd at 11 o'clock a.m. 11 o'clock a.m. in the fellowship hall for children ages five through 12. The children will assemble every second and fourth Sunday for fellowship, food, and fun. Activities will be centered around the word of God in practical ways for them. Elder Anthony Graham is the coordinator for the, re the resuming of the children's church school. Let us pray for him and pray for the children and pray for the continuation of our church ministry. Please continue to pray that the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven, and also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalms 1, 22, 6 through 7. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Your continued prayers and financial support are needed and very much appreciated. God bless each of you. Thank you. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Glad you made it out of this rainy Sunday morning. Amen. He's still worthy to be praised. Amen. They were singing forever and ever. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. And he reigns forever and ever. And I'm a witness. Amen. You know, sometimes we wake up in the morning and we can take it for granted. But the truth of the matter is we didn't have to wake up. Amen. He didn't have to let us live. Amen. We have air to breathe and we can lift up our hands and we can say hallelujah one more day. And I'm happy about that. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know what? It's our offering time, and I always like to shout God out because when you try God, and I say try, I just mean that you just take him at his word and you just do what he tells you to do. That's all I mean when I say try God. I mean, he actually tells the truth. You know what I'm saying? If you actually do what he say do, then you get the results of what he said. Amen. And so every time I do what God tells me to do, my mind is blown at what he does. Amen. So I got a personal testimony again. Amen. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, you know, it's not always the tangible things, you know, but God knows how to bless you in a, in a mighty way. And I remember God asked me, to do something for him. He asked me to do something for him. And then sometimes we can look for people to give us back what God told us to do. But they're not the answer. God is, you know? And I obeyed God. And I remember I was leaving the sanctuary and the Holy Ghost directed me to go to this particular place, right? And I said, why? I ain't got no money, you know? But I just said, okay. You know, so I went and I'll be honest, I just sat out in front of this one store because there ain't no sense of me going in. I ain't got nothing, at least in my opinion, right? You know, so I just showed up. And so finally I got out the car and I started going in and they were having this amazing sale. I mean, amazing sale, right? When I finished shopping, I saved more than what I actually even spent. Amen. And God told me, I know how to bless you. I know what you got and I know what you need. You just keep obeying me. And I'm going to keep on opening up the door. And I'm going to keep on making a way where there doesn't seem to be any way. God has amazing ways of blessing us. But we must be obedient and do what the Lord tells us to do. And the Lord tells us to take your earnings. You know, take a part of it. You know, before the law, you know, God had this principle in place. Amen. Of putting him first. Amen. And so he asked for you, when you get paid... 
Put a tenth aside. Put something aside for him. Specifically, just like you pay your bills, the tie you owe to the Lord. Amen. An offering you give. Give God his. And the Bible says if you bless him, he knows how to bless you. Amen. So it's our tithe and offering time right now. I want to encourage you right now. Whatever you purpose in your heart, do it with a glad heart. Amen. Do it with a glad heart because he didn't have to let you live. Amen. He blessed you to receive. Now give back to him what he's given unto you. Amen. So we're going to stand up on our feet with our offering in our hand. We have text. You can zell it. You can look to the screen. There's electronic ways that you can give. Hallelujah. And if you like me, you might need to give as soon as you get paid. Amen. Just purpose in your heart to go on and bless God when he is off the top and watch what God do. And when you have a testimony, let us know. We want to hear what God is doing in your life. Amen. So let's start from the rear. Come on down. Amen. And bring him your tithes and your offerings. then we're going to bless the offering right now by faith. Father, we thank you, Father God, for those who willingly participate in building the kingdom of God by bringing theirs off the top. Hallelujah, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to participate in the blessing plan. God, I, I thank you right now that you're not a man that you should lie. What we sow, you grow. I thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. If we don't meet our need, it is our seed. And we plant in the kingdom of God. And we have an expectation of a harvest that's going to blow our mind. That there be no lack or need in this house. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Hey, Lord, I love you. I adore you with my whole heart. I will bless you, oh God. Lord, I love you. I adore you with my whole heart. I will bless you, oh God. Lord, I love you. I adore you. I will with my whole heart. I will bless you, oh God. Lord, I love you. I adore you. With my whole heart, I will bless you, oh God. Say, I love you. I adore you. With my whole heart. With my whole heart. I will. I will bless you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. I adore you. My whole heart, with my whole heart, I will, I will bless you. Here we say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We give you the highest praise, and we lift your name today. Lord, I love you. I adore you. 
Today we thank you and give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for your goodness, for your grace that you've shown to us once again. Thank you for another Lord's Day, a day of celebration where we recognize and honor the power of your resurrection. We recognize and honor the great price that was paid for our salvation, our deliverance, and our redemption. Over these next few moments, we ask that you would breathe upon us as we look into your word. Touch our hearts. 
Give us that which we need. Regardless of the circumstances and situations in our lives, you're still God. You're still Lord. You're still King. And we bless you. We bless you that we have a relationship with you. And we bless you that we are your sons and daughters. Breathe on us, O oh precious Holy Spirit of God. But without you, we can do nothing. We yield to you, O oh Holy Spirit. Have your way in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we thank God for our praise and worship team? We thank the Lord for our music ministry with respect to the leadership of our church and to each of you, men and women of the Lord. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord once again. We're going to go in the word of the Lord to the book of Matthew, to, to the book of Luke's gospel, Luke 24. Luke 24. I'll read in your hearing verses 1 through 6a from the New King James Version of the Scriptures and then John 10.10b 10, from the NIV. Luke 24, verses 1 through 6a and then John 10.10b 10, from the NIV. Luke's reading will, will come from the New King James uh, Version of the Scriptures and then John's reading will come from the NIV. Amen. Hallelujah. What a wonderful day to give God thanks and praise. What a wonderful day to be able for the saints of the Lord to come together to worship him one more time. I ask those of you who are able, if you would stand as we read the word of the Lord. Luke 24, verses 1 through 6a from the New King James Version of the Scriptures and John 10, 10b from the NIV. And the word of the Lord says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they... And certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Verse 5. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. John 10.10b, 10 Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. We're going to be talking about part two, empty tomb, full life. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Empty tomb, full life, the resurrection's promise of redemption. So we were sharing with you last week that we could not and we cannot have a full life if it were not for the empty tomb and how grateful we are that the tomb was empty just like he said that it would be. So when we left off last week, we left off talking about this great power of redemption. We were talking about how we have, we've been justified. We, we, we can now stand before God. Uh, we can stand before him acquitted. Hallelujah. We can stand before God uh, innocent of all charges because of what Jesus Christ has done. And because you and I have been redeemed, which means that we have been purchased. We've been purchased by the blood and the life of Jesus Christ, which permanently removes us from captivity, permanently removes us from the state of sin, being totally separated from God so we can be restored to full status, full position. We can be restored as sons and daughters in the position that Adam and Eve were before they fell. Isn't that good news? That's good news. And we talked about how the psalmist declared in Psalm 107 that we should give thanks unto the Lord. Why? For the Lord is good and his what? Mercy endures forever. And then the psalmist declared that the redeemed of the Lord say so. The redeemed of the Lord should say so. We have been redeemed uh, by the hand or from the hand of the enemy. Aren't you glad about that? We are no longer on the slave market of sin. We've been redeemed. We've been recovered. We've been restored. We've been reinstated. Hallelujah to God. And because of that, we can proclaim that the Lord is good and his mercy, his loyal love endures forever. That means that his loyal love will never run out. Isn't that good news? 
The Bible de declares, the Bible tells us, uh, the prophet Jeremiah says in Lamentations 3, that every morning we arise to new mercies. And we can give God praise for the Lord is good. Regardless of what's going on around us, the Lord is good. Regardless of how we feel, the Lord is good. Regardless of circumstances and situations, we can boldly proclaim that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. I was thinking about this past week, uh, how when the, when the people of the Lord came together, and they began to proclaim how the Lord is so good and how his mercy endures forever. I was thinking about in 2 Chronicles chapters 4, 5, and 6, and 7, how the people of the Lord began to proclaim and give God worship and adoration for his goodness and for his mercy. And every time when the people of the Lord came together to give God adoration and praise that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, God showed up in a magnificent way. God's glory, God's presence showed up in a magnificent way and his presence made the difference. And I stopped by to tell you that his presence still makes the difference. His presence makes the difference in our lives. His presence makes the difference when we can see it, when we can perceive it, and be, we can be appreciative of it regardless of what's going on because that's what faith is about. We have to believe, we have to trust what he says regardless of what's happening because when you look back over your life, I'm sure everybody has a story, if you look back over your life, the times that you didn't think God would come through, guess what he did? He came through, and he's been consistent. He was consistent before you got here, and he's not going to stop being consistent. Therefore, we can give him glory. We can give him praise. We can give him honor and adoration and declare the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. I'm preaching better than you're responding, but it's all right. I said the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. I thank God for his mercy. I said I thank God for his mercy. There have been times in my life life that I really needed the mercy of God. Hallelujah. And I have seen the mercy of God. Hallelujah. When I know I didn't deserve the mercy of God, God's mercy stepped in. When I know judgment should be there, God's mercy was there. And I can proclaim that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. If I eat of the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil, and if I don't, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. His mercy is still good. And we give God praise and thanks and adoration. When we peruse Luke 24, there are a few things that, that came to my mind as I was, as I was um, meditating and studying, studying the passage. And, 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 uh, and I shared with you last week that we'll be talking about the, the effects of the empty tomb and, and the significance of the empty tomb because we celebrate, we celebrate uh, the empty tomb and we're going to do that until Pentecost, which is the third Sunday of May, because, because of the resurrection, we have unlimited power. Because of the resurrection, we have unlimited resources. And every once in a while, we need to be reminded. And one of the things that, that came to my mind was is that the empty tomb is significant because the empty tomb is evidence of the resurrection. The empty tomb was the visible proof that Jesus had risen from the dead and it was the first sign that the extraordinary had occurred beyond natural occurrences. It's amazing that the extraordinary occurred even when situations and circumstances said that Jesus should be in the tomb because everybody else who died is still in their tombs. Are you listening to me? But the empty tomb tells you, tells me, tells the witnesses that there is the evidence of the resurrection. The empty tomb also tells us that it is the fulfillment of prophecy. Both Old and New Testaments tell us that Jesus was going to come, he was going to live, he was going to die, he was going to be buried, and he was going to rise again. The Old Testament prophets told us that in Psalm 1610, Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, Hosea 6, 2, Jonah 117. You can listen to the tape, you can listen to the, to the recording and get it. And additionally, when Jesus lived on the earth, he told his disciples that he was going to die and be risen. He told them that on three, three occasions in Matthew 16, 21, Mark 8, 31, and Luke 9, 22. What am I telling you? What I'm telling you is when Jesus said that he was going to die and be risen again, guess what happened? He died and what? He was risen again. Therefore, we can trust what he says. And because we can trust what he says, we still can proclaim as the redeemed that the Lord is what? good and his mercy endures forever. 
One of, the, one, of the, one of the additional things that came to mind as I was perusing through the text and, and as I was studying uh, this week, uh, this past week, I, I thought about the, the empty tomb significance because of something very, very poignant happened when we read the Gospels and when we read about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we see is there are women who went to the tomb. They were following the burial customs of the Jews, which involved anointing the body of Jesus with spices. I need you to hear me. Uh, this was an act of devotion. This was an act of respect and love they had for Jesus Christ. What we see is we see that the gospel writers, each of them includes in their story that when Jesus was resurrected, there were women on their way to the tomb to finish out the embalming process. The embalming process took place on the day that he died, which was Friday. And then on the third day, it was customary for the embalming process to be concluded because there was no embalming to be done on the Sabbath day. Are you listening to me? And the Bible uh, gives us clear pictures that it was early on uh, Sunday morning, early on the first day of the week. The Bible says that the women went to the tomb to finish the process. I want you to hear me today. And, 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 and one of the things that, that came to mind as I was, as I was meditating on this and I was, as, as I was studying on this, what we see is, hallelujah, is we see the historical credibility of the gospel story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their stories are credible because of these women. Why do you say that, Pastor? I say that because women were viewed as unreliable witnesses in court in the first century. Hear me. They're, they're, what they had to say was, was not relevant in court because of the customs and the culture that they lived. So they, 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 were, they were viewed as unreliable witnesses because of the culture. And the gospel writers uh, were, 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 were unlikely to mention women, hear me, they were unlikely to mention women among the first to witness the resurrection. Why? Because they were not considered credible witnesses. Are you listening to me? So the gospel writers might have selected witnesses more believable in their own culture if they had crafted a story to persuade readers of the resurrection. Therefore, as it would have been ineffective to create detail, including women, might be evidence of the account's validity. In other words, what I'm telling you is they wrote what they wrote because what they wrote was the truth. They reported the facts. So Luke and the other gospel writers were determined to record the events as accurately as possible. So regardless of the cultural norms, regardless of what society was saying, women's testimony would be accepted if they were the first to discover the empty tomb because it was the truth of what transpired. In other words, what I'm telling you is, is that the gospel writers were not interested in kissing people's tails. They were not interested in what society had to say about them. They were not interested about what their peers had to say about them by including women in their story, by including women in their account. Because why? Because women were not considered valid resources as witnesses. But the gospel writers wanted to report that which was accurate. And because they wanted to report that which was accurate, what happened? They included the women in their story. Can we take it a little further? So the, the gospel writers included women uh, because, number one, it was true. And then they saw something, they saw something uniquely different about Jesus' ministry when it came to women. Because all of the prophets and, and the sages, they looked upon women as second-class citizens. But Jesus didn't look upon women as second-class citizens. Jesus actually elevated women. In the Gospels, when, when it came to his treatment of women, Jesus was portrayed as going against the grain of society. His treatment of women was all-encompassing and accepting of their worth, value, and dignity. So the Gospel writers included women as their first witnesses 
to the most significant event in Christian history, and that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as I was studying this, my mind had to do what it normally does because that was powerful in and of itself that they would not even ordinarily include women to validate a story, but because they knew that the women were the first to discover an empty tomb, they included it in their story. So as my mind does what it does, I said, where were the apostles? They followed him for over three years. Where were they? What happened to them? Why were there only women uh, on their way marching to the tomb that they discovered that was empty? And what I realized, or what, what, was, what I recalled was, is that according to the Gospels, following Jesus' arrest, and crucifixion, the disciples were said to have been dispersed, confused, and afraid in Jerusalem or a neighboring town. In other words, the disciples were scared. And when you read the account, uh, after, their, after they go to, the, go to the tomb, go to the empty tomb, and the angel gives them, gives them a message and tells them, go to Galilee like he said. Uh, he said that he was going to rise and go to Galilee and tell the disciples and Peter, let them know that he is risen. And they came, especially Peter and John came after the fact. But the reality was they were in hiding. They were afraid. They were dispersed. They were confused. They were afraid. They were dispersed. They were confused. They were scared. But God used these women to proclaim the first message in Christian history. And that is he is not here. He has risen just like he said that he would. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what this tells us is, this gives us a fulfillment of prophecy in that the inclusion of women as witnesses can also be seen as a fulfillment of prophecy. Joel prophesied about 500 years before Jesus came on the scene, and Peter picked up what well, Joel, well, Joel left off on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, and Peter proclaimed what's going on is what Joel said. God said that he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, and then he said, your sons... And your daughters will prophesy. Hallelujah. So the presence of women at the tomb and their role as the first messengers of the resurrection can be viewed as a demonstration of this new era of the spirit where both men and women are carriers of God's revelation. Aren't you glad about that? Women, y'all should be happy up in this place. You should be excited uh, that God included you long ago. When you were when you were discluded, when you were not included, God included you. Aren't you glad about that? So when we talk about the resurrection, we understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides for us as believers, we have security in what Jesus had said. We have security in what Jesus promised. When we look at the resurrection, the first thing that the resurrection, uh, uh, well, an additional thing that the resurrection provides for you and me is eternal life. Jesus' resurrection is the first of those who he is the first and he was the first of those who had, who had died. And that demonstrates that we will be raised to everlasting life just like he was raised from the dead. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he, just like Jesus got out of the grave, we coming out too. So we will be resurrected one of these days, those of us who die in Christ. We also have the promise of victory over sin and death. And what that tells us is, hallelujah, the power of sin and the power of death no longer have authority over us. Pastor, what are you saying? What I'm telling you is, is that the power of sin has been broken over our lives. And what that means is because of our connection with God, now when we sin, we do it by volition like our forefathers Adam and Eve did. Hallelujah. But that's not, hallelujah, that's not the, the end of the road because even though we sin, the Bible tells us that we still have an advocate with the Father and his name is Jesus Christ. 
What the Bible also tells us that we have victory over sin, the power of sin, which means that we will not be eternally separated from God. And what that means is that although we may die physically, hallelujah, we will live forever because of what Jesus has done. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, uh, as, pro, as Paul was proclaiming, Paul was taunting death. Paul was taunting the adversary. And Paul proclaimed in a song, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, oh, grave, where is your sting? Why? Where is it? It, it? it has been lost in the shuffle because Jesus actually has taken the keys of both death, hell, and the grave. Aren't you glad about that? And I love this. The resurrection provides for you and me the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In, in John's gospel, chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus told his disciples uh, that he needed to leave so that the helper or the comforter could come to them. And, and, and the good news is, is that we understand that the comforter or the helper is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in the earth today that dwells in the lives and the hearts of those who love him. And then John records after Jesus was resurrected in John 20 and 22 that Jesus breathed on his disciples. This is after the resurrection. And he told them to receive the Holy Spirit when he breathed on them. And that let us know that the Holy Spirit is seen as the power of the resurrected Christ living within believers, empowering us to live and serve in his kingdom effectively. The Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. When we said yes to Jesus Christ, the presence of God was awakened on the inside of us, and that is the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul declared it this way. Listen to me, saints. In Romans 8, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, and Christ lives within you. I want to say it again. And Christ lives within you. I'll say it one more time. And Christ lives within you. I mean, right now, not going to, but right now. Christ lives within you. And then the writer goes on to say, Paul goes on to say, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. And this same Spirit is within you right now. In other words, the power and presence that raised Jesus from that tomb lives on the inside of you today. 2,000 years later, that same spirit lives on the inside of you. And I love the way Rick Renner described what happened in the tomb. Rick Renner says in his book entitled Paid in Full, he says, and I quote, the power of God, listen, the power of God exploded inside that tomb. Now, we're talking about Jesus, Jesus' physical body being dead. Jesus was a dead man. And Rick says that the power of God exploded inside that tomb, reconnected Jesus' spirit with his dead body, flooded his corpse with life, and he arose. Hallelujah. So much power was released behind that sealed tomb that the earth reverberated and shuddered from the explosion. Are you listening to me? There was power that took place in that tomb. The power that was in that tomb was so magnanimous that it caused an earthquake. The Bible tells us, Matthew's gospel, 28 verse 2, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Listen to me. Uh, on Friday and, and Saturday, as I was um, meditating on, on the passage, and, uh, and uh, I already had thoughts in mind and some notes already prepared that I was going to share with you, I heard the Holy Ghost say that he says, there is a rumbling taking place. I heard the Holy Ghost say, to tell greater new light, there's a rumbling taking place. And, and, and it, was as, it was as I heard the rumbling, and I said, a rumbling taking place. And then he directed me back to the passage in the Bible where it says that as Jesus, after Jesus' resurrection and how there was so much power that flooded that tomb, the Bible tells us that 
in that sealed tomb, behind that sealed tomb, behind the tomb, the earth reverberated and shuddered from the explosion. What was the explosion? The explosion was that the power of Almighty God entered into a tomb and hovered over the corpse of Jesus Christ and caused life to come back into Jesus. Now, when we read in the Bible about resurrections, because there are some resurrections that have taken place uh, in the, both the Old and New Testament, what we read is, is that God often used another person. He used the prophet. He used the man to cause the dead person to come back to life again. That's number one. And number two, each of the dead persons who had been risen, both Old and New Testament, they died again. But what was uniquely different about Jesus, there was no prophet standing in front of this empty to, in front of this tomb. There was no man standing in front of the tomb of Jesus declaring to Jesus that he should come forth like Jesus did like Jesus did Lazarus in John chapter 11. Remember, Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and he called his name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Well, there was no one who stood in front of Jesus' tomb and said, Jesus, come forth. But I want to stop by to tell you today that the Holy Ghost stopped by that tomb. I said the Holy Ghost invaded that tomb. And the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, invaded that tomb and caused Jesus' spirit to be reconnected to his body. And an explosion took place. An explosion took place. So the Bible lets us know, the Bible lets us know that there was rumbling. There was a rumbling. And I, and I stopped by to encourage you, Greater New Life, that there was a rumbling. There is still a rumbling. There is a rumbling. I hear a rumbling in my soul. I hear a rumbling in my spirit. God is up to something. Will you tell somebody that God is up to something? God, hallelujah, God is up to something. And so as I continue to study and as I continue to read, hallelujah, as I get ready to come to a close, as I continue to study and I begin to read, and I, and I said, what is a rumbling? What, what do earthquakes symbolize? Or what does it earthquake symbolize and the Holy Spirit he hallelujah he blessed my mind as I begin to dig and study what I understand is is that an earthquake symbolizes divine intervention in other words that means that God is at work and since God is at work that means that man is not and that includes you and me <laughs> I want to say that again I stop by to tell you that God is at work. Not man, including you and me. And the rumbling that God is up to, we will know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Just like Jesus came out of that tomb, God says, in the midst of your tombs, in the midst of your dead situations, he says that I am at work. And you are going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was nobody but God. Let me move on. An earthquake symbolizing the shaking of foundations. I need you to hear this. That God, hallelujah, by, the, by his infinite grace and spirit, by his presence, there is a rearranging what has been relied upon. There is a rearranging, listen to me, of what has been relied upon. What do you mean by that, pastor? God says our tactics, our manipulative ways, our erroneous belief systems and traditions are being shaken. In other words, hallelujah, what we have been rely, relying on that has been faulty in our lives, God says, I got to shake the foundations of that. He says, I got to shake the foundations, hallelujah, of your ways, of your means, of your tactics. I got to shake the foundations of your manipulations in your situations, those erroneous belief systems and traditions that you got going on in your circumstance. God says, when I show up, you're going to know that it was not you. It was not your traditions. It was not your tactics. It was not your manipulative ways. It was not your belief systems, your erroneous belief systems and traditions. It was by my power, by my spirit, says God. I need you to hear me today. God says, he says an earthquake symbolizes the awakening of faith. In other words, God was sharing with me that there will be a transformation. There will be a transformation from fear, doubt, and unbelief to faith, assurance, and boldness. In other words, in those areas, regardless of, regarding our situations where we've been fearful, where we've been doubting, where we've not been believing, God says there will be a reawakening of faith. He said a reawakening of trust and assurance, a reawakening of boldness and confidence that regardless of what's, hallelujah, regardless of what's going on, 
around. And regardless of what it looks like, God is going to do exactly what he says. And then he says, he says, the earthquake symbolizes an opening of a new era. Pastor, what do you mean by that? What I'm sharing with you is, is that there is an end of old, of the old world order. In other words, there is an end of the way of being and living. There is an end to the way you've been being and the way you've been living. Are you listening to me? There is a new world order. There is a new order that's coming into your life. Hear me today. There is an inauguration of a new and fresh era in your life's experience. Another way, in other words, God says, you, you, we got to, we got to give the old away. We have to let the old go and be open to what it is that he wants to do for us regardless. And even though it's never been done that way before, we've never seen it that way before. It's never happened that way before. God doesn't care about what has happened before. He says there is an opening of a new era that's coming your way and you and I need to give God thanks. You and I need to give God praise. We need to proclaim that the Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. So the text says, Matthew 28 and 2. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Part of the text.